Hello everyone, welcome back to my workbench up here in the study at Dongit's Model Railway. In my recent Trainomatic Decoder review video, which you can see here if you haven't seen it, this Derby lightweight unit disgraced itself, repeatedly failing to stop or stay stopped. It wasn't a decoder issue, it will do the same thing with a Zimo chip in it as well as the Trainomatic. It's not the layout either, it'll do the same at the club layout. And it's just this unit, everything else is behaving. It has to be the unit itself. Let's have a dig into it and find out why and what can be done about it. To remove the body, a screw underneath the front bogey needs removing first. That's a pain to get to, requiring removing the front bogey. I've already had the bodies off these recently and that screw never got put back in. So let's go straight to removing the many annoying clips. These are clips on the chassis that go into loops on the glazing strip. They are an absolute pest to get disengaged, but once you do have them all disengaged, the chassis will drop straight out. We need the PCB out. That means removing the drive bogey and motor, and the interior. To get the motor out, there are four screws around the edge for the motor housing. There's also one on top of the motor housing which retains the drive bogey. Careful of these wires, they aren't very long. And this drive shaft is tiny. There are three screws which retain the interior. Once these are removed, there are four more tiny screws to remove the PCB from the chassis. This is a black coated PCB, so it's a bit harder than normal to trace the connections. But careful studying of the lines and some use of a multimeter to track continuity and they can be mapped out. I have had a go at this board previously, but my multimeter ran out of battery, and I had to stop before I'd finished working out all the connections. There's several diodes, resistors and capacitors in the middle of the PCB. Four diodes can be put in a diamond pattern to make a full wave rectifier, and what I initially assumed was going on was that four of these were being used as a full wave rectifier to connect the carriage lighting to the pickups full time. That's not really the case, or at least not in a straightforward manner. This circuit, as Backman designed it, is a compromise to try and make both DC and DCC work reasonably well. With a simple DC blanking plug, pins 1, 2 and 8 are connected together, as are pins 4, 5 and 6. There's no components on the plug, and critically pin 7 is not connected to anything. To get a positive connection, both lighting pins, 2 and 6, are fed through diodes. This is D1 and D2. If either pin is pulled high, the lighting board will see a positive voltage. DCC chips will only ever pull these pins low to sink current, never high. Under DCC, the positive connection comes from the positive power connection on the DCC socket, which is pin 7, through the centre pair of resistors, R3 and R4. The purpose of R3 and R4 is to dim the coach lighting LEDs only for DCC mode so that the light intensity is comparable between DC with a max voltage of 12 and DCC modes which typically run on at least 16 volts. The negative side of the interior light is much simpler. This was connected to both rails via diodes D5 and D6 so whichever was low would provide a current sink. This works absolutely fine in DC but in DCC mode, there's an unbalanced power draw through the decoder. Pin 7 is providing the power for the carriage lights, which is sourced from whichever rail is higher voltage at the time. But the negative side is not going back through the decoder at all. For basic DCC setups, this is fine, but this unbalanced current draw does cause problems. Decoders have problems reliably detecting ABC when wired like this. There is a simple solution. You have two options, you could remove D5 and D6 from the board, or just cut the track coming from the lighting negative connection. It's the closest one to the edge of the board, so this is dead easy to do with a few strokes of a triangular file. I've done this in two places on this board, 
so that even if I get a stray bit of metal, it will not bridge both gaps and reconnect the circuit. Now the lighting negative is isolated from the track, take a tiny bit of wire and connect the lighting negative terminal to the spare pin on the DCC socket, pin 3. This is the auxiliary function output, and you can see the wire I've added here in green. Note that there's limited depth available here, these pins were filed by defrock from the factory. So I've made sure I don't add a bigger solder joint than there was already here. This will achieve two things. One, the interior lights will now be controllable by function output 1 on the decoder. And two, the current drawer will be balanced, going through the decoder on both sides. This will stop any interference with ABC detection from this light. This does mean that if you ever want to de-chip the unit and run it on DC again, the interior lights will not come on by default. You could get around this by reconnecting the cut track, or by adding two diodes to the DCC planking plug to provide the connection on pin 7 there. I'm not so worried about converting this back to DC myself. Now that I know this has a reliable fix, this unit is a keeper. I'd figured the negative side out of this last time the unit was opened, so this wire was already installed, but I hadn't fully traced the positive side. Now that I know that the current is for sure coming through the decoder, I'm very confident this is a reliable fix. When assembling the vehicle, make sure the tiny drive shaft is seated in both the motor flywheel and the drive bogey properly. Now we've connected the interior lights to function output 1 in the motor car, we really should do that in the trailer car too, so we can match the behaviour. Getting the body off is a similar process. The lower PCB has a similar set of components to provide constant power, although in this case, because it's a 6 pin decoder, there is no common power connection on the decoder to start with. This is a constant source of irritation for ABC on 6-pin motor decoders, as there's no default way to wire them right. You'll probably find by default locos with 6-pin decoders, if they have lights, have problems with ABC. You'll also probably find that a 6-pin decoder will have a positive power pole on a pad somewhere on the decoder, but this means some really delicate soldering to the decoder to expose this into the loco. Thankfully in this case I don't need to detect ABC on this vehicle, I just need to make sure the lights work in the same way as the front car. The proper way to do this would be to use a 6 to 8 pin decoder adapter, use an 8 pin decoder with at least 3 functions, and connect the positive pole and AUX1 function to the lights. I didn't find a 6 to 8 pin decoder board commercially available, but something not being commercially available isn't a hard barrier anymore. I could design one and have it made by PCBWay. PCBWay's service allows anyone to design a PCB, upload it, and have it produced to commercial standard in small quantities. A run of five PCBs, which are 100mm by 100mm square, ideal for a small electronics project, perhaps tidying up ad hoc wiring under a baseboard for example, could be had for a shade over 10 US dollars, including economy shipping. 100mm by 100mm is a cost efficient size to be ordering. You don't save much going below this size, so for a small PCB it's generally most efficient to panelise several into one board of this size. The board can be scored, cut or drilled such that smaller PCBs break out easily afterwards. It would need to be a small PCB with 6 pins on one end like a 6 pin decoder has, but with an 8 pin socket through the side to connect an 8 pin decoder into. It would have to have two additional solder tabs to expose the two further pins, the power pole on pin 7 and the third function from pin 3. The downside of this is you probably end up with loads of the little PCBs. The cost efficient small production size is 5 boards of 100mm by 100mm square. You can tile a lot of these tiny adapter PCBs into that space. Unless you already have another PCB project to make, and can sneak this design into a spare corner to break off later, or you genuinely do want fleet quantities of these for converting hundreds of DMUs, you're probably going to end up with a lot of spares you don't have much use for. I have precisely one of these DMUs. In theory, I may get one more in future. If a green with yellow panels example, which is Midland region allocated, turns up at the right price, I would be tempted. So I have a maximum need for precisely two of these adapters. Even if I did have such an adapter, I'd still have to fit it, an 8-pin decoder, its plug and harness somewhere in this model. There's not a lot of packaging space here. 
I have experience with converter boards to 8 pin sockets and the total height of the adapter board with the plug and the socket is not inconsequential. Several models that I've tried to convert from 21 pin to 8 pin with those converters have not gone back together properly purely because of the height of the socket. I'd be kidding myself if I said I could for sure fit all of this still inside the toilet like the 6 pin decoder. And it's not the decoder and harness that's the primary problem, but the 8 pin socket and plug itself. Add to that, the 8 pin function decoder I fitted would need to be a 3 function unit. Many function decoders are 2 function decoders, not 3 function. I don't see this as a sensible option in this case, unfortunately. There's also the potential to do this really properly and design a whole new floor PCB with an 8 pin socket integrated into it and have that made by PCBWay. This would be a much more in-depth manufacturing process, but would help significantly with the packaging problems. As this would be well above the 100mm standard board dimension for ordering, expect it to be significantly more expensive. Plus you now have to integrate the pickup system and the front lights as well. There's a lot of work here to design this. PCBWay would still be happy to make the boards for you though, but do expect it to be more expensive to make them at this much longer length and you still need to ensure that the function decoder you're using has enough full power functions. An option out of left field is to go have a look at the Backman Spares site to see if there's a PCB from a similar DMU. You want one that provides the same connection to the bogies, the same front light arrangement, the same connections to the lighting board in the roof, but has an 8 pin socket in the trailer car. The obvious candidates to check are the class 108 and class 105, which share the same decoder per car architecture that this unit does, but use an 8 pin socket. Unfortunately, neither of these look like they help. The Class 108 trailer car has a different style of bogey pickup, which is mechanically in a different location and would need further changes in the underframe or bogies to adapt to. The Class 105 trailer car is a closer match mechanically, but has connections to the roof near the other end of the vehicle that would need extensive modification or intrude into the passenger area, and the front lights look to be a different arrangement too. The best solution for one-off quantities is to use a 6-pin function decoder with extra function pads, and just attach wires straight to those pads. The Trainomatic function decoder I am using does have additional function pads, but they're not full power outputs, they're logic level. The connection diagram does indicate that you can connect LEDs across them though. I've cut both tracks to the lighting contacts and wired them to the correct pads on the decoder for one of these outputs. The PCB modification to the loco was dead simple, cut through two tracks right at the same edge of the board. I did this with the triangular file in two places like I did with the power car. Wiring to the decoder was an absolute faff. Sadly, I can't publish what I said while I was trying to make sure none of those tiny little pads got bridged, but it's done now. However, assembled like this, the lights were almost invisibly dim. You really couldn't tell if they were on or off under bright light. But you'll remember the diagram for the decoder did not have any resistors on it. There are resistors on the lighting board in the ceiling. I'm now going to remove the resistors that are integrated into the ceiling lighting board and bridge the contacts where they were with a tiny piece of wire. That will improve the brightness of the LEDs. If you are enjoying this video or finding it useful, hit the like button. If you want to see more of my layout or the stock I run on it, hit the subscribe button. If you have a question, comment or suggestion, write it in the comment section below. The wire bridges need to fit underneath the lighting spreader bar. There's enough space here to clear a surface mount resistor, but neatness is required here. If like me you can't manage perfect neatness first time, some gentle filing may be necessary. Reassembling the trailer car is pretty straightforward. For once, reassembly is actually the reverse of disassembly. This is what it looks like with sunlight and the room lights on now. The trailer car is still noticeably dimmer than the driving car, but it's a lot closer than it was. In a darker area, away from direct light, it looks like this. 
However, light brightness wasn't actually today's primary problem though. Working ABC was. Let's test that. Huh, having fixed the lights in the power car so they aren't causing an unbalanced power draw, it's pulling up much sooner. This is the same decoder and same programming it had before. This is direct evidence that even when it was working, ABC detection was compromised, and it was starting to slow down further into the section than it should have. Let's add some distance to the stopping position and try that again. Ah, much better. And let's see what happens if we leave it here for a bit. It has now been sitting here waiting patiently for about half an hour without so much as a hint that it ever tried to move. Throttle is fully on to, so if it did go, it would go. Compare that to how it was to start with, and you'll see how much of a dramatic improvement this is. Now, as to the brightness of those lights, real interior lights in first-gen DMUs weren't dramatically bright. So long as I can get these two cars fairly close, I'll be happy with them. I don't need them to be as bright as they were from the factory. If I decide to brighten the trailer car, the next step would be to connect two new wires from two more of the function outputs on the decoder, so I can drive each LED individually from an output. The challenge with this option is where to route the wires to avoid blocking the passenger interior, and how to make sure the model still comes apart and goes back together with those wires installed. If I decide to dim the power car, I would want to increase the resistance in the circuit. I think I spotted there are two resistors in parallel on the main PCB, between the power pole and the lighting connection. Removing one of them would double the resistance at that point. There may even be a way to tune the brightness of the function output the lights are connected to in the decoder programming. That should probably be the first thing I try. I'll have a think about that and see if I can come up with a preferred solution. Let me know in the comments what you would do. Would you want to brighten the lights in the trailer car or dim the ones in the power car? But this has fixed my immediate ABC problem and I think this is good enough for now. There are other locos that need more attention now. See you next time up here in the study at Dongit's Model Railway.